Minutes. Action. Consideration of the minutes of the meeting of January 27, 2010. Move for approval without reading. I would second it with one uh, typographical correction, and that would be on three. Fifth complete paragraph that starts the paragraph is Commissioner Sam Manukian. That's four. That's the fifth complete paragraph. Sixth. Sixth complete paragraph, excuse me. Starting Commissioner Sam, it wasn't fourth though either. <laughs> Commissioner Sam Manukian. The second to the last line ends with the last three words, and therefore somewhat limited, should say, and therefore is somewhat limited. Are you serious? I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> we'll make that grammatical correction and move on. Next item, please. We need to vote on it, I think. I seconded it, though, with that correction. Unanimous consent on that item. Pardon me? Is there unanimous consent? Because you had a motion in a second. I believe there was. Actually, I have to abstain from, from voting on that. Okay. We, just, we didn't take the vote. That's what... Okay. Yeah. Do I hear a motion? We've got a motion. You have a motion in a second. We just need to take the vote. Just... Roll call. Please. Okay. Commissioner Devine? Yes. Commissioner Abkarian? Abstain. Commissioner Gantis? Yes. And Chair Coleman? Yes. Next item, oral communications. I have one card on this item. Herbert Milano? Chairman Colvin, uh, members of the Civil Service Commission and city staff, my name is Herbert Milano. One of the advantages that we have in a democracy is the ability to be able to have a forum for the public to speak and request issues of transparency and accountability from government. And that's why I'm exercising here today. Because I have a significant issue with regard to a conflict of interest that I presented to you last week with regard to Commissioner Gantis. Uh, Commissioner Gantis uh, has for many years served uh, in this commission and during the same period of time he has also represented his clients before other boards and commissions here in the city representing among others a taxi cab owner company and a parking management company. The problem with this type of conflict of interest is that he eventually may be sitting there with you making decisions with regard to the future employment or the future uh, uh, promotions or issues of conflict with regard to the very same employees that are approving or presenting the information that is in, uh, would be in Mr. Gantis's uh, client's uh, uh, <coughs> presentation. And I think that that is a significant problem. Now, it is stated that from time to time the, the, uh, the City uh, representative of the city attorney present during those commission meetings will basically highlight the fact that there's a conflict of interest, and Mr. Gantos, I guess, could or uh, would be uh, uh, available to recuse himself. And I was wondering how many times during all of these years he has recused himself due to conflict of interest of issues that were presented before employees that eventually came before you, employees who eventually were creating or had created <coughs> reports that would have been favorable to Mr. Gantos's clients. Now. We can say that from time to time there are conflict of interest and they could be brought up, but this is a city of 200,000 people, and Mr. Gantos has been here for three terms now. It is, it is incredible that we cannot find individuals with a significant amount of experience in personnel matters. I mean, we have major Fortune 500 companies here that we could tap into individuals <laughs> who basically really know the requirements of individuals of large departments. Now. If I were selecting someone for this commission and be on a board, you know, assisting it, I would be looking at breadth and scope of experience in dealing with large divisional interdepartmental uh, organizations and have the breadth and scope of some very intricate and difficult to analyze and assess uh, positions. The, um, I think that there is enough time and enough evidence here to ask for Mr. Gantis's resignation from this commission. We should no longer tolerate or accept that there be this type of blatant conflict of interest, you know, where uh, individuals and city employees will be very much afraid of presenting information that may be contrary or, uh, or that may be um, 
that may highlight deficiencies in the application of water Mr. Gantus' clients. Now, I, you know, I guess we can all say we appreciate his three terms in office, but it's gotten to the point that oftentimes Mr. Gantus is arrogant, authoritarian, and disrespectful. You know, there comes a time when actually the public needs to be able to address with you without the fear of intimidation coming from Mr. Gantus. So I think that there's enough reason for us to say, you know, enough is enough. You've been here long enough. You know, he served us well enough as it is, but I think it's time for a change, and this commission should know that. I ask for Mr. Gantus's resignation because it's the right thing to do, and the, and the residents and stakeholders of Glendale should demand that level of transparency. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Trapp, <coughs> Um I don't know if I can make a quick comment on this, but maybe we can move item number 10 right after oral communication because I do want to make a comment uh, on this particular issue. <coughs> after the oral communication. Mr. Chair, it is appropriate for the commissioners to make brief comments. Based on those statements that were made? That's correct. Then can I make a statement? Certainly. Okay. Um, Mr. Milano, just so you would know, I think that there are people who actually serve in the Design Review Board and actually are architects. There are people who, uh, I mean, I represent people in front of the city of Glendale and I would have the same exact conflict that you just mentioned. Uh, and I think that there, are, there isn't a commissioner that doesn't do something with the city of Glendale. You're in, the, uh, in a committee or a commission. I'm sure you've been involved in different committees in the city. I'm sure you would have a conflict at some point. So I really, in reference to the arrogance and all that, I won't make a comment, but in reference to the actual working, working relations uh, and what Mr. Gantis's right is as a commissioner to stay with this commission, uh, that I, I must just make a quick comment on that because I think that to pick on Civil Service Commission as a whole compared to Design Review Board, they have architects that actually sit on Design Review Board and actually represent Go, go in front of design review board. I mean, that's even more of a conflict if you want to mention a conflict. So um, I don't see a conflict of interest when it comes to representing clients in front of civil service commission or doing, I mean, in front of the city or doing something else. Uh, in reference to the term limits, as, as I think you know, civil service commission is the only one that requires a uh, longer term, could, could have a longer term. You could serve five terms. And an experienced actually commissioner is very necessary for hearings. Trust me, it's a long drawn hearing sometimes goes for days and days and days. For my own purposes, um, I believe two terms is enough. As such, I won't be here past May and you're more than welcome to apply or whoever wants to apply, there will be an open seat here. But in reference to how many terms somebody could serve, uh, I believe that a civil service commission is one commission out of all the commissions that actually having a seniority, having an experience is extremely important. And bringing someone new to try to learn the procedure, in my opinion, is just not a good idea. Just that was a comment from me on that particular issue because I think it's been brought up before. And I, I would never, uh, me and John, Mr. Gantis, have had many, many of arguments, have had many, many disagreements in this, in this dais and outside, for that matter. But I would never, ever ask for Mr. Gantis's resignation because of his integrity when he listens to the hearings because of the manner in which he pays attention and I would not I would ask Mr. Gantis uh, not to even consider the resignation that's it thank you uh, I have one very brief comment uh, Mr. Milano every commissioner on uh, this commission was uh, nominated by a member of the city council and then the city council votes and it's in my opinion instead of coming before us with this issue and now for the second time um, I think you ought to take it up with the city council because we serve at their pleasure and it is only the, uh, the city council that has the authority to remove us for whatever reason and um, secondly um, your comment about <clears throat> Commissioner Gantis being arrogant 
I take offense to. I've worked with him for uh, almost nine years, and he is outspoken. Um, he is opinionated, but in my opinion, he is not arrogant, and I do take offense to that language. That's all I have to say about that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. <clears throat> uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Milano, for your comments, because obviously it's important that there be a forum, and I uh, applaud your opportunity and uh, your ability to do that. Thank God we have that ability in the United States of America. If, you, if I have been viewed as being arrogant, I will extend my apologies. I don't intend to be arrogant. Um, I intend to do my job, and I intend to continue to do my job. I think it's important to note, because not only have you brought this up, but it's been brought up in other forums, about what the role of the Civil Service Commission is. I do not have, nor do any of my com fellow commissioners, the, number one, there are no promotions. We don't promote in the city of Glendale, and even if we did, we, the commission, does not do the promoting. We do not hire. We do not fire. We do not promote. We are here to... Uh, uh, the closest we get to the employees, if you will, is if there are disciplines or, 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 the, or the, the, the same. It was interesting to note, I kind of put together some numbers over the years, and I, I have calculated how many hearings I've been in and how many employees might have gone through for the past 10 years. And the percentage I have calculated that might have been here, approximately 20 out of but between retirements and resignations, et cetera, there's probably been around 2,500 to 3,000 employees that have gone through this city, and I've been involved in maybe 20 hearings, which is less than 0.1% of the possibility of a conflict. Uh, but I don't want to get into that. I think it's important that you know what the Civil Service Commission does, and um, I do not <coughs> perceive a conflict. There have been conflicts in which I have recused myself. Uh, indeed, one I can recall one incident where there was an employee who I had represented. I recused myself because that was a conflict. Um, I don't find a conflict in what you say, and more importantly, um, I am appreciative of the fact of what this commission does and the importance of this commission for the retention and, and protection of the civil service system, which is an interesting and unique system at least in, amongst uh, private. It's not unique in government, but it's certainly not the same as what you have in private. At the risk of going on, I, I will just say thank you to my fellow commissioners, thank you to Mr. Milano for his words, and that I will not be resigning. Okay. <clears throat> on that note, I think we should note that uh, uh, Commissioner Manukian arrived at uh, a little before 5.15, during oral communications. It's okay. <laughs> we have you here. Next item, please. Item four, recruitment and examination status report. You didn't say <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the commission, uh, this item is uh, for note and file. It's the recruitment and examination status report showing the current activity relative to our recruitment uh, here at the city. Um, the recruitments are listed there by uh, each of the staff members who are working on them. And these are the recruitments at various stages uh, between the opening, closing, filing dates, and the various examination processes. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, this report, uh, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Any comments, any statements, any questions? I just had one question on what is the status of the uh, fire marshal? I didn't see that it looked like the date closed was 1-8, but it doesn't show exams been given or... I'll have uh, Ms. Hunanian uh, address the status of that particular recruitment. Good evening, members of the Commission. Manya Hunanian, Senior Human Resources Analyst. Uh, Commissioner Devine, while we have closed the bulletin, uh, we have not uh, fully reviewed the file and scheduled the next uh, phase of the recruitment process. So we will be doing that sometime in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Next item, please. 
Item 5, eligible lists established. Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, uh, this again is a note and file uh, report indicating the eligible lists that have been established since our last meeting. Um, we have uh, three lists that have been established. They are, all three of them are promotional only. The report indicates the uh, number of total, of total number of applications received as well as those who ultimately made the eligible list. Uh, once again, I'd uh, be happy to try and answer any questions on, uh, on this particular report. And this is for uh, your information only. That's five. Any comments from the from the commissioners? <clears throat> Mr. Milano, do you want to speak on this issue? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Commissioner Chair Coleman. Okay, commissioners, my name is Herbert Milano. I was wondering, when information is being presented for you to note and file, why is the information being presented to you if there is no action on it? The, um, I was assuming that in the process, when you receive information, is to maybe get some clarification and maybe give some direction to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to human resources with regard to this. I have a particular question with regard to uh, the IS project manager. A promotional uh, position here where you only have one eligible person. Um, from time to time for the past couple of years I have been asking information concerning the qualifications and the certification of project managers. The reason why I ask that is that in an organization such as a city you basically have two major types of, of jobs. You have process jobs which are things that are, are routine or operational that get done all the time and then you got projects and you have a significant number of projects in the city. Just about everything is and usually it's a project. A building gets built is a project, a road gets built is a project, you know, pipes get built is a project, a system implementation is a project, uh, meaning for example like the uh, the PeopleSoft software that took years and years to complete. And so I asked for a very simple question because very few projects get completed on time and on budget. And I asked the question, what is the certification, external certification that your project managers have? There's a, the Project Management Institute provides uh, a way to employees from either private or public to be to pass a test, and uh, and the names could be you know entered and, and people can basically say oh yeah this person is authorized or have received uh, the project management professional designation, and these projects are sometimes in the millions of dollars, even software in the millions of dollars of expenditures that requires the highest level of of experience. So I'm assuming that if a person is being promoted, that at the very least, concerning the hundreds of thousands of dollars that are involved in these things, and given the, the significant number of cost overruns that the city has had, that we would ask for and expect certifications in us PMPs, project management professionals. This city does not have a project management a, uh, office where best practices are assembled and where projects get evaluated. And I wish the city did. Other cities, such as Seattle, Washington, they make very specific goals and targets that they will have less than 5% uh, of projects that are allowed, should we say, or expected to go uh, to have a cost overrun or extend beyond its, uh, its extended, expected uh, uh, completion date. <coughs> but we don't have that. And what I see often from the experience of the projects that I looked at and from the uh, significant number of cost overruns, that we don't have a PM, uh, project management office and we appear not to request a PMP certification. And I think this is what brings up to mind, that you have an internal uh, promotion, but we really don't know if we're really asking for the right type of qualifications that are the norm and the standard throughout the industry, especially in IT. Thank you very much. All right, next item, please. Item 6, Class <coughs> Specification for Approval, City Auditor. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, uh, this item is the class specification for the revised specification for the city auditor position. Um, this classification and this function was first established back in 1999 where the uh, Office of City Auditor was, uh, was established as a sort of an independent entity uh, reporting directly through the city manager's office. Um, <coughs> What we're uh, doing is the, this is really the first revision of this specification since that time. Over the years, not only has the function grown, uh, but the office has grown, the staffing has grown, and uh, the role of that uh, position has uh, emerged somewhat. Uh, this specification is, uh, is seeking to update uh, those roles and indicate what uh, changes have occurred since this was first established back in 1999. Uh, really, there are three primary areas of, uh, of change in this position, one being the uh, elevation of this position to an executive level status, uh, the second being uh, um, that this position was given responsibility for the administrative investigation function, which is a very, very important function that uh, in the past had been handled both by the Human Resources Department, city <coughs> attorney. Uh, and oftentimes within the, uh, the department itself. Um, at this point, the, uh, the function rests within the city auditor's office within their purview to ensure that we have uh, you know, fully independent investigations when there are employment matters or issues of fraud or you know, anything along those lines, harassment. Um, the third change uh, has to do with the uh, minimum requirements relative to experience. Uh, again, when this uh, position was first established back in 1999, um, we were somewhat new uh, in, as far as uh, what we were looking for. Uh, we'd never had this function previously, and uh, for the uh, initial search, we only required a five, five years of experience uh, in internal audit of work. Uh, we're proposing to elevate that to eight years' experience. Um, given the uh, the level of responsibility and trust that this position uh, entails, um, the reason this is coming before you right now is that we do hope to uh, uh, conduct a recruitment for this position. In fact, uh, our intention is to open the filing for this uh, next week. Um, as many of you know, uh, Bill Fox, who uh, pretty well set the standard for this job, he's our first city auditor done an outstanding job. Uh, he recently received a promotion to uh, the Water and Power Department where he's their assistant general manager overseeing their entire financial uh, function there. So uh, we have a, a vacancy and uh, we're seeking to, to fill it at this time. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions on this specification, uh, this function, and um, if uh, Mr. Fall here from the city manager's office as well. That. Uh, Try and answer your questions. Uh, just a quick question. This is uh, open examination. This examination uh, will be a promotional exam. Promotional. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Fox uh, has developed a very, very strong staff internally, uh, and there's some very, very capable oh, okay. people internally who we uh, we think are ready to step into this role. Mr. Chairman. S certainly. Uh, then that means we will not be approving the job bulletin. That's correct. And may I continue, Mr. Chairman? The bulletin will be a reflection of this right. specification, uh, word for word. Uh, why did we decide? How many people are in the auditor's office? Uh, the auditor's office has a total of, uh, I believe, six. And what what was the rationale for going? promotional rather than open? Uh, again, it is our belief that uh, we have a sufficient number of in-house in candidates uh, ready for this, this promotion. It's okay. I, I would I'd appreciate that because I'm not sure I share that view, but I'm not sure I have the authority to share that view. <laughs> uh, well, certainly, your, your, um, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, your your opinion on it would uh, we would always be of uh, of interest. Going to an open or promotion uh, position is always a, a decision that we give great consideration to. Uh, we always like to think that within the city we have gone, done a good job of succession planning. That in fact we have people inside uh, who 
who are simply the premier individuals will be qualified for the next position up. That is not always the always the case. And at that point, we will always come back without hesitation to commission to ask your authority to do an, uh, an open recruitment. Uh, in this case, uh, we actually uh, have several people that uh, I would say would be the envy of other organizations trying to recruit for a, a city otter. These are individuals who, at a very minimum, have multiple years in internal auditing and are all CPAs and then have individual expertise, whether it be in uh, data, system, uh, data systems or other information system audits and, and so on. Um, we've actually been able to uh, attract the individuals not only just in internal audit, but actually within our finance department that uh, more than that go uh, quite beyond the minimum qualifications for this position, and we would expect that we would have a, a good turnout on the recruitment. Mr. Chairman, may I continue for a moment, please? Certainly. Um, this is an executive level position, am, am I correct? That's correct, right. And the, is with this redoing of the bulletin, is it fair to say that all investigations regarding employee misconduct are going to be headed by the city auditor? There, there's actually, uh, it's actually broken down into other categories, into several categories. What we have actually assigned to this unit is kind of what we had informally call the high crimes. Uh, these are where it's uh, workplace uh, harassment, sexual discrimination, uh, uh, allegations of that nature. We've just felt it is best to lift that out of, uh, of any of the department re reviews and have the auditor uh, do that separately. So it's really, it's three or four major classifications of investigations. Uh, when it gets down to other levels of a uh, employee misconduct or other, uh, other issues that simply don't rise to those, that nature of, um, of, uh, of concern, then the auditor's office does not uh, conduct those investigations. Those are either done by the city attorney's office, by the HR department, uh, or an outside attorney. On occasion, given the, uh, the nature uh, of a complaint, uh, notwithstanding, again, the role of the city auditor will, will actually retain outside counsel to do the investigation if we feel that would cause the greatest level of justice to take place. The auditor has done, and I have a specific recollection of, of, of an investigation done in, in, in two cases, that did not involve sexual harassment, et cetera, et cetera. So are we taking some functions away from the, the auditor then? Mm, no, the, it, 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 the, uh, there certainly could be other other investigations. They have done theft. Uh, they have done, again, it, we, we evaluate it from the standpoint of the complexity uh, and nature of the investigation. So, yes, beyond sexual harassment, workplace discrimination, uh, violence in the workplace, those tend to be the predominant ones. And we have, of course, the auditor themselves actually doesn't do that. We actually have a dedicated uh, individual with a background in an in investigation who actually conducts these investigations and is not involved in any manner at all in the other financial workplace audit or performance auditing any of the other aspects of the, of this but yeah so they they have done like employee theft and, uh, and other other uh, you mentioned the department of so, so before you go just a uh, qualification on this issue uh, who makes a decision as to what cases go to the city auditor's office well, it'll be a uh, uh, as the the there's a, a policy that's actually been adopted by the council at a point in time when we made this determination that we wanted to uh, to have our employee investigation some some level done independently, uh, and within that we identified that certain investigations just by default would go to them, and again that's sexual harassment, workplace discrimination, uh, workplace violence concerns. So by default those those go there. Now the city attorney the person personnel director, their HR director, and myself will, uh, if there's any question on whether it should go, then we will sit down we would collaborate together and see is there something unusual about that case that would make this inappropriate for whatever reason, it's actually hard to imagine what it would be, but it is some reason inappropriate that it be done by the internal auditor, uh, and then in that uh, instance uh, we would go to the outside. In some case, in that case, might even involve the, uh, the city council because of higher outside retention. Sorry, Mr. That's okay. So you, you mentioned the Department of Finance. Have you identified how many people would qualify internally to apply for this position? 
Well, I know aside from the, the, the finance director himself, who actually is a certified internal uh, auditor now and who I, I would imagine would not be applying for this, uh, for this position, I'm personally aware of at least three other individuals in finance who currently work in finance outside of the internal audit uh, department who had the, the qualifications. Now, whether or not they would they elect to pursue, I don't know. But as yeah. far as having, again, Beyond the minimum qualifications, I'm aware of uh, th at least three individuals. Of, of, in that department, and then right. are all six in the auditors qualified? Probably not because of the experience requirement where we've moved, where we are recommending moving the experience up to uh, eight years. I'd say there's probably three that would meet that, that, uh, that qualification. So we're, we're talking about a total? that we've identified that would be eligible. Again, we don't know if they're going to Correct, apply right. of six people. I, I would feel that we would have five or six very qualified individuals to apply for this. And, and out of that, I mean, there's a lesser number that I would say are extremely well qualified. And these p six people, or five or six, or I remember, I don't want to point, right, you know, exactly. uh, have sure. already achieved, we're not going to have them come in and, and, and what, take six months to become a certified internal auditor. Oh, no, no, no. And, and uh, do we know whether they're all CPAs or not? I, I don't want to personally. Okay. Matt, Matt may know beyond. Uh, I I know that all of our internal auditors are, and I know that at least two of the individuals that I'm thinking of in finance are CPAs in addition to the qualification. I am through. Well, we <clears throat> here in the city of Glendale do try to promote from within. So I move for approval. Yeah, on, on, sorry. Uh, one one Third comment. Huh? And there's a card. Oh. Uh, I just have one comment, as I've, I've said in past seven-something years, and I'll say it again, as Matt knows very well. I hate if we are tailoring our specification to meet a particular individual. And that is something that I will I have fought against. Uh, when I'm not in the Civil Service Commission, I will fight against. And I think it uh, sends the wrong message to anyone else uh, that it's in here. Uh, you know, m one of the problems that I have is if we move the experience from five to eight, uh, is this something that was done just to eliminate some people, make some people more qualified? Why did we say eight and not, why is five less Desirable than eight. There's actually a Mac, but there's actually a very direct uh, explanation to. Yeah, please to give that. it to me Mac. so I can, in good conscience, I can say yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Carrion, uh, that was my my decision in reviewing this. I mean, our, our first uh, our first intent on updating this specification was to make sure it it reflected the current job duties and the current functions that are being handled by a uh, city auditor, but. Uh, as I was going through this, I noticed that we had uh, that five-year experience requirement. As you know, we do have a series within the auditor department, an internal audit series, where there's a, an internal auditor, a uh, senior internal auditor, and a principal internal auditor. And in reviewing that specification, because uh, it's all in the series format, I noticed that the principal internal auditor required eight years and the senior was something like six, and the internal auditor was five. And it, it only be, was logical to me that uh, the position you know, that, that person would be reporting to would have at least the equal number of years uh, of an experience requirement. So that's where uh, I settled on eight. That's a, that's a logical. <laughs> that, that, that was that was we didn't say, think it was appropriate That's why we that, asked the, the questions. that the manager in charge should have less experience than the employees that work in the unit, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes. You know, in this instance, I I don't always share Mr. Epkarian's concern on this because I do like promotional, but I, I you know having six people for an executive level position um, it concerns me, but I don't know. I I really would prefer and open if we're going to do this is a very important function and it was created because of some very serious problems that occurred in the late 90s and we know what those are at least I do um, and um, I just think that I, 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 this is not what I normally do I don't normally like to go outside the city but I'm not saying these people aren't there and they may indeed qualify but I just think a, a better panel I think we get a, a better cross-section of experience um, um, 
I, I don't know, I just would prefer to have an open myself, but obviously that's not what's being presented to us here. I'm not sure that's our authority to do that, but that would be my druthers in this. <clears throat> just to, just to Any other comments? Just to clarify, I wasn't going there. I was just asking a question. No, I was what. Then I know you were. I mean, you said you don't always agree with me. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't say to go open, but I just wanted to clarify that, and I think the clarification was given. I don't have any problems of going promotion on this one because, anyways. It's <clears throat> a quick comment. I mean, um, the total six that they have, I mean, the, what, what happens in a scenario that you don't get this, the, the applicant? Then you can open it back up? And yeah, that's correct. And and, it, and if we don't, because you know, we can't go pull these employees, and yeah, we, we need to obviously manage this very uh, appropriately. And if for some reason we ended up where only one or two uh, applied uh, out of that, which I think we'd be surprised at, but if only one or two applied and we didn't feel that they um, that they really met the standards that Bill Fox has, uh, has established, uh, then we would be the first to say this just doesn't doesn't serve us well. You know, we would come back and do uh, and request doing an open examination. Uh, the, that the, it, it, this this position for the last ten years has been an absolutely uh, vital uh, vital position. It's created credibility in areas where we need to have credibility uh, uh, established, and uh, this is not the time for us to, to compromise and really on what the history of it has been to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? All right, I have one card, Herbert Milano. Uh, Civil Service Commissioners, my name is Herbert Milano. Um, I wasn't intending on, on speaking on this particular item, but I wanted to at least give you uh, a, a perspective. Uh, because I, I've been one of the Bono, few... You're only missing number six, so this was this was actually nice to choose. Oh, I'm just kidding. Okay. What I wanted to, ma to say is that... I didn't I, interrupt you, Mr. Milano. Really. I apologize. Not this time. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, here's the, the odd part. Simone, is that, I, I apologize. I didn't no, no, that, that's quite all right. Is that a few minutes ago I was asking for Mr. Gantis' resignation, and, and I'm about to laud Mr. Gantis for his observations. Um, <laughs> which is, is, go is, figure. Is, is the, <laughs> go figure. The, um, so you'll have dinner with him in, you know, in a few months. That's no, how we started. Yeah. Exactly well, what I, what I want to say is that uh, I've been one of the few individuals who actually attended and have been looking at the audit com uh, committee meetings uh, and have taken a very keen interest in, in the functions of the audit committee. And, um, and I, I applaud uh, uh, the city manager for I initiating this position and making it available. What I want to say is this, is that it's one of those positions that it needs to be truly independent and it's crucial that that position be independent. And it is possible that uh, as an executive position, that person might be in a better position to, uh, to ask for and request data that someone in another department might feel is, should we say, is their, is their prerogative to keep confidential as such. But I don't think that ever stopped um, uh, Mr. Fox from accessing the information that he needed to make his evaluation. My concern, again, is, is going on that independence. But I wanted to address uh, another, which is the, the length of service versus the scope and breadth of experience. Um, in my company, when we try to hire or we go after programmers or systems people, you get applicants that oftentimes come in and they've been working for one company for their whole lives, and we call them maintenance programmers. And we've got those who have been in, out in the public servicing as consultants with a breadth and scope that is much larger and much more demanding. And I wonder to what extent that is the kind of experience that you actually want. If you have an open experience from public accounting individuals who are hammering different organizations and gathering a wide range of experience so that when they come in, they're basically looking at this organization from different perspectives rather than internally grown within the constraints that they have grown to see during several years of being within, uh, within this organization. The, um, uh, I think that, you know, they having an, an opportunity of having it uh, as an open type position might be a significant advantage in that it will allow uh, human resources to look at the breadth and scope of other applicants who may be coming in with some really valuable skills to challenge what oftentimes are uh, 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 new ways of approaching uh, problems. For example, 
uh, the way that information is placed into a system and the way the systems change. An individual coming from the outside who have experience with multiple different systems in a way of testing how information could be, should we say, hidden. Because I'm, I'm in that kind of business as such. And I know how easily it is for information to be, not to be as transparent as it could be. The, uh, a few years ago, we had a problem uh, with regard to the accessibility of personal information from the Glen uh, from the Department of, uh, I think it was Water and Power. They were asking us for our social security and the uh, and our license and other kinds of personal information that in the wrong hands would have left uh, this left the public in, in a very dire and precarious situation. Um, and apparently that was, was actually being promoted um, as a way of basically verifying the credit worthiness of customers of Glendale Water and Power. But it just so happened that the month before, there had been an, under, a situation where an employee had been accessing information that was private. And those are the kinds of things that I think someone from the outside may bring an experience that may be much more relevant to the type of functions that an internal auditor may have. Thank you. Okay. Next item, please. Move no quiet. Move, move, move to approve. Excuse me. Second. Oop. We have a second. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Devine? Yes. Commissioner Abkarian? Yes. Commissioner Gantis? Yes. Commissioner Manukian? Yes. Chair Coleman? Yes. Next item. Now, please. Item 7, Mid-Year Report on Hourly Employment. Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, this is our uh, uh, Mid-Year Report on Hourly Employment. Uh, this is a report we do twice a year, uh, typically at the mid-year of the of the uh, uh, fiscal year and then at the end of the fiscal year. And um, if you recall, the, the origin of this report was uh, concern expressed by the, the Commission over the proliferation of full-time and near full-time uh, hourly type positions throughout the city. Um, a number of uh, measures were taken in order to, uh, to better police that, that particular situation. Uh, the biggest thing being the establishment of a 1,250 hours maximum for uh, any hourly employee within the fiscal year. Um, anything above that would require specific exemption from the, the city manager's office. As in addition to that, we have uh, regular reports being prepared by our, by our payroll section addressing the uh, any employees that are approaching that 1,250 hours standard. There are also other internal controls that we've set up in order to better police this situation. Um, this report that we're doing, again, is the mid-year report, which measures from July of 2009 to January 1st, 2010. And uh, it's the report, uh, again, our examination of those positions that have uh, that have uh, come close to 1,250 hours. I'm pleased to say that there were none. Uh, this uh, this year, uh, at this at this point, uh, we have none that have uh, reached the 1,250 hour standard, and that that uh, applies uh, through roughly the beginning of the fiscal year to about mid January. So, uh, um, I, in years past, we have had maybe one or two, or maybe even three or four positions that have gone above 1,250 hours at this point. But uh, this year, we're on track to to not have that. Um, once again, the, the true measure of success of this policy is to see where we're at at the end of the fiscal year. But uh, as of this point, uh, we have we have none that have uh, reached that threshold. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to try and answer any questions. Yeah. Uh, not a question, but a request on the um, next report on hourly employment. I'm requesting that we have just the number of hourly employees in the city as well as how many years they've been working in the city. Okay. And you can compare that to full-time permanent, or at least uh, be able to give me a, um, a rough figure of, we have approximately, uh, this 
number of full-time permanent uh, employees versus specifically this number of hourly employees and how long they've worked for the city as an hourly employee. Is it, thanks, Chair, Chair Coleman. Is it only the ones that are working uh, that would exceed the 1,250 standard, or you you want to know all of our hourly employees? Well, I would like how long to know how many worked. hourly employees we have working, uh, whether they exceed the 1,250 hours or not. Okay. I'd also like to know how long they've worked for the city. Those people who have exceeded. Correct. Okay. Because there are some, we have some uh, employees in the library, for example, that have been with us for 25 years in a, in a purely part-time capacity, working one day a month or three days a month. That You're not interested in that. You're interested in those putting in substantial hours. Correct. That correct. Okay. We can do that for our next report. Any comments? Questions? I have one card. Mr. Herbert Milano. Uh, Chair Coleman, Commissioners, my name is Herbert Milano. I, I'd like to present to you my, my perception on, with regard to uh, uh, full-time hourly employees. I think that there's a justification that can be made for full-time uh, hourly employees. Um, and, and the issue with me is that the, the economy of a city or of a region doesn't remain steady. It fluctuates significantly. So if you take, for example, building and safety, you could find that if you were to look at the last five years, we grew at roughly one half of 1%, or roughly what it would be around 300 new homes or new uh, dwelling units that are created. And as new homes are created, it, pu it puts an impact on building and safety. But if the economy changes, now you have a significant amount of activity that may remain high for a year, two years, maybe three, as we did a few years ago. And so you could actually have these temporary hourly employees remain in place during the increases that are taking place in the economy for that period of time. And then later it makes it easier to basically get rid of those employees once the, the situation stabilizes. And I think that if you look at those fluctuations throughout the various different departments, there could be a clear justification made, because it is my assumption that salary employees may be a little bit more difficult to, uh, to relieve once the, uh, you, the city finds itself in financial constraints. The, um, I would also like to make a, a, a request, and it's a request that I've been asking for for a long time, which is similar to yours, Mr. Coleman. I have been asking for the full-time equivalent number of employees. The city of Burbank, throughout all the reports, provide that information. The city of Pasadena and all their financial reports provide that. And I've been told time and time again that we don't maintain or collect or even are capable of finding out what our full-time equivalent number of employees are. Because when you take one of the other reports you received today, which shows you the total number of salaried employees, if you then take the full-time equivalent, we finally know, right, what is the actual burden with regard to employment that the city is carrying and allows us to compare what is happening to those trends year to year. So now that you're asking for that information, I would request that this commission ask for a report that gives us full-time equivalent positions. You have people so software, you have people in IT capable. This is a report that should be very easy for anyone who's properly trained to pull the report out without any, any problem. Thank you very much. All right. Next item, please. Item 8, Agenda Forecast. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, uh, uh, this item is the Agenda Forecast for our upcoming meetings. As you can see, we are uh, planning to uh, do the amendments to the Civil Service Rules at the February 24th, uh, 2010 meeting. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, the following uh, meetings, we intend to have uh, uh, specifications and other 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 actions. Our next advertising budget expenditures report is set for for April. Um, beyond that, uh, if there are things you want to see or things you want to move around, uh, to, I don't know uh, if you would know uh, right off the top of your head, but um, approximately when are we going to reorganize the uh, commission? I think that is uh, typically done the first meeting in uh, in June. June. 
Okay. My recollection. Okay. Thank you. Next item. Item 9, reports information. Past due employee performance evaluations. Mr. Gantis, would you please? Thank you, Mr. Coleman. We have no past dues from the city manager's office, city treasurer's office, community planning department, finance department, Glendale Water and Power, human resources, and the police department. We have a total of 19 first notices and eight second notices, total of 27 notices out of 1,751 employees. We continue, I think, Mr. Chairman, to keep everybody's nose to the grindstone. We haven't had a third notice in a long time. A couple of years. At least. <laughs> At least. Okay. Next item, please. Item 10, Civil Service Commission staff comments. Any comments from the staff? No, sir. Next item. Move to adjourn. So be it. We are adjourned.